Well, good morning, everyone. It's a beautiful uh, morning here on January 17th, 2021. Coming from Way of Life Church in Rancho San Diego, California. Great to see all of you this morning. I'm in our sanctuary by myself. We're in the middle of a, a bit of a uh, quarantine. We'll be back live in the sanctuary next week, but we welcome all of you who are joining us today either live or in the future. I'm going to start off a little different this morning. Instead of uh, giving our title of our message and talk about the message, I'm going to share a little bit of a, a background story. In the early part of this past year, 2020, before the stay-at-home orders that we all experienced, I had uh, been fortunate to lose a few pounds. And during the summer months, as I was swimming next door at my son's house, uh, I had uh, become aware that my swimming trunks had uh, become a little loose on me because of the, of the few uh, pounds I lost, the few inches. And I had a, a little bit of a difficulty cinching them up. And I realized at that time that I needed a new pair of swimming trunks and uh, I uh, started to give some thought to that. Well, before I knew it, the summer had actually passed. And uh, Christmas, we experienced Christmas just a few months ago. It was fast approaching. And in our family, we have a tradition to where we pick names, our adult children, our five adult children and their spouses. We pick names. And uh, of the person's name that you draw, what you get to do then is purchase that gift for that individual. And it's a, it's a matter of uh, just finding out what they want. So we have a way to notify one another what our desired gifts might be. And uh, we like that because we can spend more money on our, our, our own children or our grandchildren or how, however we see fit. So it's one main gift that we give. And uh, I uh, was very excited to um, put into my desired gift a new pair of swimming trunks. Along with that, a shirt. Uh, the uh, dollar amount was 50 bucks or less. So I found online a, a real nice pair of swimming trunks I thought might fit the bill. Uh, along with the swimming shirt, gave that information. And um, I then began to wait. I uh, certainly was filled with anticipation knowing that um, these special trunks would come, but uh, we made sure that we gave that information before Black Friday, because on Black Friday you got a real, you get real, real good deals. So with that said, I um, waited for my Christmas gift. I couldn't, uh, very excited about Christmas Day. Uh, and this past year, our particular, uh, uh, our particular. Uh, time when we decided who got what. My, my, I have lovely daughter-in-laws, but uh, Kristen, uh, who's married to Nick, she picked my name. And um, I was um, very excited to receive her gift. I saw it wrapped in under the tree. And on Christmas morning, I unwrapped my gift from Kristen. Even though I knew what it was, I was still filled with anticipation. And it was wonderful to open up and find my new uh, trunks and my new Christmas, uh, my new swimming shirt. So that story, uh, with the anticipation that I felt about uh, my, my special Christmas present, goes into um, what I would like to talk about during this series, and especially this morning, who doesn't like something new? We all love something new, and again, at Christmas time, this past Christmas season, we all experienced getting something new. I would trust that was your case. But we all like getting something new. We all love new gifts. And um, as I started off and began to think about this series back in, in December of what I'd like to do in January, I thought about this subject. And we had just finished a very difficult year, 2020. And in, in 2021, I think we were all hoping for something new, something new that would um, come along and uh, maybe erase all of the things, the negative things that we experienced and 
2020, but it reminded me of the Lord and His goodness and His continuous promise that, hey, take a deep breath, I'm always doing something new. And uh, so I thought, what, what, uh, what would be a better time than in January to review this promise from the Lord? That He wants us to understand that He's always doing something new. When we hear that verse, if you've been a Christian for any length of time, you understand and um, you understand that the Christian life, Christian faith, it's all new. When we come into our relationship with Jesus Christ, it's new and it's exciting. And when we hear this phrase, behold, I'm doing something new, it really is a great reminder. That verse actually comes out of the book of Isaiah in the 43rd chapter. I use it as a foundation uh, set of scriptures, a starting point for this series. And um, in the New Living Translation, when you begin to read in verse 14, it's this, this uh, title, if you will, The Lord's Promise of Victory. And um, I love that. The Lord's Promise of Victory. We have victory uh, ahead of us, in store for us. And I'd like to read these verses and make a few comments and then go on to what I'd like to share this morning. In verse 14 of Isaiah 43, this is what the Lord says. Your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, says this, For your sakes I will send an army against Babylon, forcing the Babylonians to flee in those ships that they're so proud of. I am the Lord your Holy One, Israel's Creator and King. And I'd just like to pause there for a moment like I've done in the previous weeks. This idea that the Lord, uh, our Lord, is going to send an army against Babel, uh, Babylon. It's the Babylonian, what I call the Babylonian spirit. The spirit of confusion and the spirit of pride. If we were to study out Babylon and that word, that's exactly what that means. But the Lord says He's going to send an army against that. He's going to suppress that. He's going to defeat the spirit of confusion, the spirit of pride that's so prevalent in our society today. Verse 16, the Lord goes on to say, I am the Lord who opened a way through the waters, making a dry path through the sea. I called forth the mighty army of Egypt with all its chariot and horses, I drew them beneath the waves and drowned them. Their lives snuffed out like a smoldering candle wick. And this is in reference of when God delivered His people, the children of Israel, from Egyptian bondage. And it's one of the greatest stories in all of the Bible, all of Christendom, to see God's people delivered. It was wonderful. It was a great thing. But this is what the next verse says. For I am about, um, for I am about, verse 19, for I am about to do something new. See, I have already begun. Don't you see it? I will make a pathway through the wilderness. I will create rivers in the dry wasteland. Uh, the previous verse, verse 18, I didn't read it. It basically says, that great story about the deliverance, of God's people. Forget about that. I am doing even something greater than that. So two weeks ago I talked about how we become new as in a new creation. I love that. That was our that's our first that was our first message in this sermon series. We are a new creation in Jesus Christ. When we accept the Lord as our Savior uh, everything becomes new. And we use the verse 2 Corinthians 5.17. We know this. This means that anyone <clears throat> who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone. A new life has come. And that's where we are once we accept Jesus as our Savior. And then last week I talked about another thing that becomes new when we have that relationship that I'm speaking about with Jesus, as we come to know Him, our minds become new. Our minds. Uh, when we come to know Him, our minds are renewed. I love that idea. 
And this verse out of Romans 12 and verse 2, we, we used that last week. It simply states this. <clears throat> Do not or don't copy the behavior and the customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn how to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. And uh, last week, if you missed it, it's on, uh, it's on our website and uh, Facebook. Uh, you can just click on that, A New Mind. Some really, really great, great points. I don't have time this morning to review those, but um, wonderful. So we have, we're a new creation, and we have a new mind, and this morning... I'd like to take a few moments and talk about um, what we, another uh, byproduct of this relationship with Jesus is we, we get uh, a new heart, a new heart. I'm talking about this morning, uh, a new heart, and this is the third reminder in this series. Um, let me give, give you in the big picture the five things that we're talking about, and we'll finish up next week. Um, for the next two weeks with those the five reminders are a new creation, a new mind, a new heart we're talking about today, a new spirit, and a new way of living. So uh, just, by, just as I explained uh, earlier about this idea of the anticipation at Christmas time for a new gift, I want you to really um, consider and have a spirit of anticipation that every day your heart is being made new. It's not a one-time uh, event. Every day, there's a newness that comes. And uh, the verse out of Ezekiel, uh, the two verses out of Ezekiel 36, verses 26 and 27, will be a backdrop, if you will, to this morning's message. Out of the New Living Translation, it says, And I will give you a new heart, and I will put a new spirit in you. I will take out your stony, stubborn heart, and give you a tender, responsive heart. And I will put my spirit in you, so that you will follow my decrees and be careful to obey my regulations. So this morning, talking about a, a new heart, I have three simple points I'd like to go over uh, with you this morning. Number one, we have, or the need of a new heart, we have a need for a new heart. Once again, in this verse, uh, uh, the second part of 26 is, I will take out your stony, stubborn heart and give you a tender, responsive heart. See, there is a need for us to have what I call a heart transplant, if you will. Our friend David Ponder, uh, a few years ago, underwent an actual heart transplant, the heart that he had was no longer usable, good, and he needed a physical heart transplant which he received by the grace of God and he's a changed man with more life ahead of him. Um, I don't really need to convince you or myself that we need a new spiritual heart. Um, we know this more than anything. I know this about my life, my heart, uh, more than anything. And you know about your own heart. Uh, we know what it is to have a, a stony heart. That's basically to be hard-hearted. Uh, we experience that all the time. Uh, and we know about a stubborn heart. Um, that's uh, our mentality. We, we're stubborn like a mule. Or our heart becomes hardened uh, because of um, many things, but mainly because of unforgiveness in our life. We need to be aware that our heart's uh, need to be, uh, they, they can't be like a hard stone. And we can't be stubborn by the way we think. And another byproduct of all of that, hard heart, or uh, in need of needing a new heart, is this re rebellious spirit that we all have. Um, uh, we all tend to be a little rebellious from time to time. Uh, even in our culture today, um, just buying a simple hamburger at the Burger King, it pushes the idea that we can have it our way. Uh, have it your way is their theme. And uh, so often, just like buying a hamburger and having it prepared in the way that we like it, maybe with extra pickles or no pickles, 
or extra tomatoes or no tomatoes. We think that we can have everything in our lives the way we want it. And we can dictate to people how they are to act towards us and our situations around us. Uh, we think um, because of that rebellious spirit in our heart that, and, and we push back a bit against just letting God allow things to happen in our life that um, uh, it's okay to do that. Um, we need to remind ourselves that <clears throat> inside of each one of us, um, uh, until we come to Christ, we have that sin nature. And even after we come to Christ, we're having to deal with it. Fortunately, because of the, the, the promises of God and the Holy Spirit inside of us, and um, this new life that we have in Him because we're a new creation, day by day by day we can be changed to be more like Him. Um, that original sin that uh, came uh, into humanity through the story we find in Genesis and Adam and Eve, um, we, we see that rebellious spirit just played out. You see, uh, angel, uh, uh, Lucifer, an angel that God had created, was created with a free will. And uh, Lucifer decided on his own he was going to be greater than God, and he rebelled against God. He was cast out of heaven uh, to earth. And that's where we pick up the story where uh, he says, if I'm going down, I'm going to take uh, God's creation, humanity down. And he tempted, led uh, uh, Adam and Eve into temptation to where Adam disobeyed God, had a spirit of rebellion, just as, as the devil had. And because of that sin and the sin nature entered into humanity. And that brings us to today. That's what we have going on today. Uh, my wife has this saying when, when we see situations around us. Uh, she says, we all need a Savior. And it's so true. We all need a Savior. And uh, I'm so glad that Jesus Christ is the answer. He is our Savior. And because he saves us, he saves us from that rebellious spirit. And he comes along and he is able to give us a new heart. A heart that's pliable. A heart that is not stubborn. So let me make a few other points talking about uh, the need of a, of a new heart. Um, our hearts were actually created to mirror God's own heart. I need you to understand that. We were created in God's image. And um, because... We no longer have that. We need a new heart. We were designed to love Him. We were designed to love His righteousness. And we were designed to walk in harmony with, with God and with other people. But because uh, of sin, we have a hard time doing that. Um, one, one of the most amazing parts of God's design is that He gave you and He gave me. He gave us uh, and we were designed with a free will. A free will, the opportunity, the availability, uh, the, the, uh, the right to choose right or wrong, to make our own decisions. And uh, Adam and Eve, that's how they were created, and they decided to uh, go against what God had told them. Uh, obviously, we wish they had made a different decision, but we see that they were created in God's image with a free will. God didn't create humanity, Adam and Eve, and, and humanity uh, as robots. We were designed to have free will. And uh, the Lord's desire is that we uh, choose Him and what uh, He wants. And what happens is when we uh, have that, uh, that hardened heart, that stubborn heart, uh, it causes us to refuse to follow God. That's what we see in our society today. There's a spirit of rebellion to choose not to follow God and not to submit to Him. Uh, but our, our hearts are designed to communicate with God and to, to follow Him, not to be hardened. And um, that's, that's why we see God uh, describes our heart as, as uh, especially our rebellious hearts, as like a stone. They are hard, uh, and, and uh, with a hard heart, it's, it's impossible for us to, to, to really come to God and, and to humble ourselves, and, and God comes along and He draws us, and, and, and He woos us to the point that, that He does this heart transplant. 
that I'm talking about. So we desperately, desperately need new hearts. Uh, on our own, we're not very good. I love this verse, and I'll, I'll finish this, this idea of we need a new heart with this, this one simple verse. Found in John 3, 3. This is Jesus talking. I love the words of Jesus. If I could um, only preach the words of Jesus, that's how, what I'd preach. The Bible is filled with so many other uh, great uh, Holy Spirit-inspired verses from others, such as the Apostle Paul. But Jesus says this, um, Verily, verily, or truly, truly, or listen, listen, I truly tell you, verily, verily, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom unless they are born again. So once again, we are born again when we accept Jesus Christ as our Savior. And when we are born again, this process of newness comes. We're a new creature, a new creation. Our minds are renewed, they become new, and He gives us a new heart. I like this second point, number two, the promise of a new heart. We've been promised a new heart. So in our foundational verses, uh, verse uh, 36 Verse 26 of chapter 36 of Ezekiel, uh, we read this, uh, I'll read this portion uh, to you and then read the entire two verses out of the message version, message translation. Uh, um, I will give you a new heart and I will put a new spirit in you. Uh, the message version is not a translation but a paraphrase. Eugene Peterson years ago uh, did a paraphrase uh, of the scripture. But this is what he says. I'll give you a new heart, put a new spirit in you. I'll remove the stone heart from your body and replace it with a heart that God will. I so love that. God will, not self will. We get a new heart that, that's God will. It seeks after the will of God, not self-will or our own selfish will. I'll put my spirit in you and make it possible for you to do what I tell you and live by my commandments. I so understand the need of a new heart. If we have the word of God, the precepts, the principles, how God wants us to live, we can't live that way unless we have a new heart. And uh, I, I so like unwrapping a new gift, and I so unwrapping in this context, this idea of unwrapping the idea that we have a new heart because it allows me to obtain so much more, have so much more. I can do the things that God asks of me and commands of me found in the Word of God. If I can share another scripture with you with talking about the promise of a new heart, we find that verse in Hebrews, the 8th chapter, and the 10th verse out of the New Living Translation. But this is a new covenant I will make with the people of Israel on that day, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their minds, and I will write them on their hearts. I will be their God, and they will be my people. Talking about the commandments and the ways of God... God, if we have a new heart, God can then write those commandments in those, those uh, ways of how we are to live on our hearts because it's a heart that, that really guides us. Out of the message version, these uh, verses 10 through 13, but Jesus' priestly work far surpasses what other priests do since he's working out a far better plan. If the first plan... The Old Covenant, that's the law, the Old Testament, the law, the Old Covenant had worked out. A second wouldn't have been needed. But we know the first was found wanting because God said, and the following, I'm going to read it, it's so good, listen up, heads up, the days are coming when I'll set up a new plan for dealing with Israel and Judah. These days are upon us right now. I'll throw out the old plan. I'll set up that I set up with the ancestors when I led them by the hand out of Egypt. They didn't keep their part of the bargain, so I looked away and I let them go. We know that story. 
This new plan I'm making with Israel isn't going to be written on paper, isn't going to be uh, written, um, uh, excuse me, isn't going to be chiseled in stone. This time I'm writing out the plan in them, carving it out on the lining of their heart. I'll be their God. They'll be my people. They won't go to school to learn about me or buy a book called God in Five Easy Lessons. <laughs> They'll all get to know me firsthand. The little and the big, the small and the great. They'll even get to know me being kindly forgiving with the slate of their sins forever wiped clean. I'm telling you, that's so exciting. And, and the message version, these verses finish with this phrase. By coming up with a new plan, a new covenant between God and His people, God put the old plan on the shelf and it stays there gathering dust. I'm so thankful for the new plan where God writes on our hearts the way He wants us to proceed. It's a new covenant. It's a new day, and I'm so excited um, about that. I'm not much of a writer. I have dreams of writing things, but I've read about how writers, when they have an idea, they are very excited, and they get out a clean sheet of paper, and they begin to, to write that idea out, or that storyline out, or that plot line, plot line out, and they're filled with anticipation, and an expectation, and before they know it, the uh, the paper is is filled with the ideas or the plot or the or the story, and um, I can only imagine how uh, how much anticipation God feels for your life when you have a new heart. He gets to write out uh, the plan for you, and I believe that same anticipation needs to be our portion that we are filled with anticipation of what God is going to do in our lives. But let me go on to number three, and that's simply the result of a new heart. I love this point as well. Uh, someone who, whom God has given a, a new heart, uh, he or she, they behave differently. I, I so love the word behavior, and I could spend all morning just talking about this, and I, I think the very last installment of this um, series, um, we'll be able to talk about that because we have a, a new way of living, and that's where behavior kind of falls in there. But Saul was a good example of this. God had chosen Saul to be the very first king of Israel. You can read about that in, in the book of Samuel. Um, Saul was basically a nobody, but God chose him anyway, and the, uh, the story goes in, in the 10th chapter of 1 Samuel, God sent him, the, the prophet Samuel, to anoint him as king. Matter of fact, in verse 1 and then in verse 9, Sam, I'll read it to you. Samuel took a flask of olive oil and he poured it on Saul's head and he kissed him saying, Has not the Lord anointed you ruler over his inheritance? See, Saul was a nobody, but God called him. God had a plan for his life. And he sent Samuel the prophet to anoint him with oil and to speak these words. And then he makes several predictions to prove that, that Saul uh, uh, was, was God's man. Verse 9 says, as Saul turned to leave, Samuel, as he turned to leave the prophet, God changed Sa Saul's heart. And all these things were fulfilled on that day. You see, there's a promise that comes. And when the promise comes, there's a result that happens when, when that promise is fulfilled. Just as in Saul's life, the promise was fulfilled. He was a changed man. Um, the new heart that God gave uh, Saul transformed him from an average nobody to the king of Israel. An amazing story. Not only was his, was his status changed, but his entire outlook was transformed by the power of God. And I've been talking about being born again. When we are born again, God gives us this heart transplant, and He gives us this new heart, and what happens is the Holy Spirit comes and changes our heart now from a, 
a sin-focused to a God-focused viewpoint, outlook, view, if you will. Sin-focused to a God-focused. We don't become perfect. We're working on that. We have that as a promise, but we, we're dealing with our, our, our sinful nature, the one that goes after our flesh, um, but we have that freedom uh, to make a choice. Are we going to go after that sinful uh, uh, fleshly nature, or are we going to follow after and go after the things of God? I, I love this idea that we have that uh, choice. But as I talked about, when Jesus comes uh, in, into our life, and because of what he did for us on the cross of Calvary, he, he died for us and he broke the power that controls ours, that controls us, and, and we have control over that sin nature now. Romans in, in the 6th chapter in verse 10 out of the Living Bible, a uh, 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 translation we've used for years, I love it how it says, He died once for all to end sin's power. Once and for all, Jesus died for all to end sin's power. But now He lives forever in this unbroken fellowship with God. I so love that verse. And then, then uh, to continue on, uh, receiving Him as that Savior, as our Savior, it gives us the access to His power. Uh, he transforms our heart now from a, a, a sin-hardened, sin-hardened, sin hardens our heart. We were transformed from a sin-hardened heart to a Christ-softened heart. When we're separated from God, uh, our sins become hard, and we find it impossible to please Him. Uh, so, what we do is we tend towards selfishness, we tend towards rebellion, we tend towards sin, but when we have a, a Christ softens heart, those things are just reversed. With new hearts, we are declared righteous. And I love this point, this is a result of a new heart. We are, you are, I am. We are declared righteous. If you were here in the sanctuary this morning, I'd have you repeat after me. Declared righteous, or shout, declared righteous. We are declared righteous before God. Uh, 2 Corinthians 5.21 For God made Christ, who never sinned, to be the offering for our sins, so that we could be made right with God through Christ. We are declared we are declared righteous because of what Jesus has done for us. Uh, another thing is that the Holy Spirit gives us a desire to please God. And I so love this. A desire to please God. Uh, because that's enjoyable for me and that's enjoyable for God. Just as we unwrap a present and we enjoy that, it's the same way when we have a new heart. You see, if you receive a present, and it's wrapped beautiful, and it sits there under the tree at Christmas, or it sits there on the table at your birthday, or under your bed, and is never unwrapped, and never utilized, it is of no use. It becomes nothing. It's as it is. It's as if it were nothing. In a few weeks, and through the summer months this year, in 20. 21, I'm going to slip into my new swimming trunks and my new swimming shirt and I am going to enjoy them. And as we come into this relationship with God, with Jesus Christ, through Jesus Christ, and have a new heart, we now have the pleasure of enjoying Him. And He has the pleasure of seeing one of His children follow in the ways of to know Him. The Holy Spirit gives us a desire, once again, a desire to please God that is really foreign to us, or what's foreign to us, in our hardened heart state. We are transformed into His image. And I like this as I, as I wrap it up. Uh, we're declared righteous, we have a desire to please Him, and we're transformed into His image with ever increasing glory which comes from the Lord 
who is the Spirit. We, we, see, we see that in Scripture. I, 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 we have it right here in 2 Corinthians 3 and verse 18 out of the New Translation. Uh, the New Living Translation, this idea of being transformed with ever-increasing glory. This is what it says. So all of us who have heard that veil removed can, can see and reflect the glory of God. And the Lord, who is the Spirit, makes us more and more like Him as we are changed into His glorious image. I want you to be encouraged this morning uh, to understand that not only are we, not only do we need a new heart, we're promised a new heart, and there are benefits to a new heart. And I so love these, these last three that were, were righteous in, in the sight of Him, and uh, uh, there's a desire to please Him that's enjoyable for both me and for the Lord, and that we're transformed into His image. I, I, I just so love that. Uh, let me uh, go ahead and, and, and close in prayer. I, there's a lot I could say about this, but when I, when I, when I realized that I could only talk for half an hour, 40 minutes at the most. I realized, boy, you got a hard job as a minister. So I always pray over and think about the points I do want to stress. And I believe that if you ponder, if you meditate, if you think upon these points and these verses uh, today, throughout the day, throughout this week, and as we go through this month of January, this series, uh, everyone doesn't, who doesn't like new, I believe that this year can be one of the best years of your life. Uh, I mentioned just last week, I said, even though we turned the calendar into 2020, that doesn't, uh, into 2021, that doesn't mean that all the events surrounding our lives are going to be made new. The month is new, it's January, the year is new, it's 2021, but I'm sitting in the middle of an empty sanctuary because the circumstances haven't changed. They're headed in the right direction, but we're still in the midst of this virus that brought, was brought to us in 2020. So there is a promise that God is with us, things will become new. He says, can't you see, even though in the midst of all of this craziness, I'm doing something new in your spiritual walk as in your natural walk. I want you just to go forward saying, thinking and knowing that God has something good for you and not to um, uh, be depressed or discouraged even in the month of January that the situation hasn't changed. It is changing. God never changes, but our situation is changing because God's always been good. So I'd like to pray for you, and I'm going to believe that this word this morning about a new heart is going to bring life to your body. It's going to be like my friend David Ponder, who when he got a new physical heart, he felt so much better. There was oxygen flowing through his body. Uh, there was uh, movement in his limbs. His mind became new again. His spirit was uh, rejuvenated. I'm going to believe, just as we get... Uh, some people experience a, 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 a new physical heart. I'm going to believe that our spiritual heart that we've been given will bring new life to you. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your grace and your mercy in each one of our lives. And this morning, as we've taken a moment just to look at this idea that we can have a new heart in you, or we get to receive a new heart in you, we pray that it would bring encouragement to each one of our lives. Let us honor you and look to you in the midst of our situations and our circumstances, knowing that you are a good God and you're doing a new, you're doing a new thing. So we thank you now and we pray a blessing in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. Well, thank you so much for joining me. Until next week, have a great day, a great week, and God bless you.